lecturer and welcome Chris. Uh, Chris was a graduate of 2013 from this uh, fine institution. Um, he now works for a company called FWJK and uh, he'll be talking about the QS profession as a whole. Thank you. Thanks Chris. No, thanks Chris. Um, yeah, when Matt and Brandon asked me to do the speech here today, I thought, you know, what is my current today profession um, guest lecture? What did you do? And then we've got this old bullet, literally stand up in front of the class, pick up the scale reader, guys, does anyone know what this is? It's great. One of the guys in the back of the class got up saying, guys, it's a scale reader. This is going to be your best friend for the rest of your life. You're like, no, surely not. I mean, I spent three years studying construction management. Now I'm honest here, pretty much brutal here, God given that, to be honest. And I'm going to go measure for the rest of your life. Guys, I can safely say that you're not going to measure for the rest of your life. QSing is completely different to what measurement is. It's completely more. Um, aspects in that field. So, that being said, what is a QS? Uh, what do your, when your mates ask you, um, you know, what do you say? What do you answer? Anyone? Oh, yeah. What do you say, like, when the guys come up to you and say, um, what do you study? You answer, you know, I'm studying points today, and they look at you with a blank stare saying, what is points today? So, anyone, what is, your, what is your standard answer? Obviously, cost control and Obviously, working out the feasibility of buildings and making sure that they you know, work out and controlling the cost as a project. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, what I might my, my stand on is you know, that of like diving on that to now. Cost control is a, a lot more intricate thing that you actually do realize. I'd like to say, I'd like to myself a financial counsel of the building industry as well as a lawyer of the building industry. That's essentially what you do. You do cost control with contractual management. That's why you guys do um, subjects like con law, biz law, um, yeah. So, long and short of it, the QS is a person who stands up and, and um, controls costs throughout the development as well as contractual uh, management throughout the development. Long and short of it. Um, your professional bodies, I'm sure Karen touched on this last week. I'm sure she gave me the whole speech with the glass balls and the bouncy balls and <laughs> one needs to be dying at it. And don't worry guys, it's, it's a mountain to climb, honours is hectic, I'm not going to be around the bush, but if you break honours into a bite-sized chunks, you'll get through it no problem. So, as long as you take control of the smaller things, or the bigger things will take care of themselves. Um, yeah, so I'm sure she, she touched on all professional bodies, I'd like to touch on it, but I already don't want to delve too much into it. We get several different types of um, professional bodies, SSC, QSP, and RECs, um, Association of South African Quality Surveyors. Um, personally, I'm going the SSC, QSP route. Um, it just made sense to me. I'm in South Africa. Um, I don't see myself going overseas before my accreditation. Um, and yeah, so the way you get registered, I don't know if she's touched on it before, what you have to do is you have to register for the council. Uh, you pay a, Five hundred grand registration fee. Um, you then have to pay one for a month, um, every month. But if you're fortunate enough, your, your uh, whatever company you do end up working for will pay that and will subsidise that. And what you need to do is you need to keep logs similar to what your your back work. Um, I don't know with, with car and the whole back work thing. You have to kind of write down what you did throughout that period and whatnot. It's a lot more tedious than than that. Um, to find hard to believe. Uh, what you have to do is you have your, your project, you have your project value, and you have your different stages of what the QS actually does. So I have your inception stage, um, so essentially what your inception stage is your feasibility is estimates, um, so you actually kick start off the developments. And we have your pre-contract stage, where it will be um, full work, full management, um, uh, tender adjudications, uh, bringing your main building contract and signing contractual obligations. Um, you have a contract phase where you, you manage costs throughout the, the development. Um, you'll be dealing on a on one in one basis with your main building contractors. It really is an arm wrestle throughout the day and day out. Um, they'll submit payments to you. You have to certify their payment claims. Um, and during the contractual contractual phase, you'll be going out to tender for different different um, subcontracts, like let's say partitioning, ceilings, and um, all sorts of things. Uh, you'll then have your post contract, which is your final account, where you'll settle on a final amount of um, the contract. Um, so yeah, that's what you'll do. You'll 
literally just log and say, okay, cool, um, today I'll put um, usability as an estimate for a development in the fourth floor. Um, this is what the development came up with, and you just write a little sentence in your log. So say eight to, eight to ten. And you go, okay, cool, I worked on that now the development from ten to twelve. And you go and you log your development. It's tedious, but the can run it can run away with, away with you. Um, so yeah. Do you have to be a QS after you graduate? No. Um, I feel the, the lessons you learn in, in honours and during your three years of construction management is actually really to do with cost. Um, we had a guy in our honours here that actually became a chef. And you know, although he's good at cooking, I'm sure you implement his whole QS um, background of kind of deciding how much his material you're going to use in his food cost. <laughs> Okay, it's got a budget of, let's say, X months. Okay, I need to look about this, this meal. It still needs to stay straight, but it still needs to stay within budget. You know, long and short of it. Um, but yeah, there are several different opportunities out there in other queues. Um, as I mentioned before, are queues being counters? No, they're not. Um, if you had to go to a guy that's 50, 60 plus, I don't know, that, that hangs around a lot of wash and um, eat forever. Um, asked me what I did. I was like, no, I'm a QS. So I said, you're a bean counter. No, I'm not a bean counter. It's so much more to life than being a bean counter. That's what they used to, that's what QS is used to be. They used to have these old programs that used to block, that you just sit there and measure. And you get into these, these old panels that used to just kind of, I don't know, like count your quantities and then put your race there. You just literally sit there all day, just counting all day. And that's what we want. I think, I like to feel that the QS industry has kind of evolved into different different aspects, um, more than just counting numbers. Um, so yeah, where did I go after this essay? Um, look, I was fortunate um, that halfway through my audience here, uh, throughout my whole back work, uh, I had guys telling me, what are you doing, you know, you're wasting your time, this is, this is the worst industry to be in, um, just, just call it a day and I'll go study something else. This is in your honors here, you just have three years of construction management, you just like half of the honors here and you just seem to depressed. You're like, how the hell can someone tell me this? I'm just one graduate in the field that I shouldn't be in. But guys, it really isn't out there. Like, if you, if you listen to those guys, it's, it's actually wasting your time. I was fortunate where I, my sister's uh, best friend's ex-husband, a um, guy by the name of Danny Williams Jones, Crystal Parker from the FWJ had um, just dropped him an email saying, hi Dave, I'd like to talk to you about the industry. Nothing, nothing hectic, just like to sit down on a one-on-one -on -one basis and you please just you know, what, explain what you do, um, how you go out and the QS firm and, and what, what is actually out there. Um, it's like cool Chris, I'm from um, I'm down in, in Sunday, on Sunday in weeks, two weeks time, he's pop back. So I met with a guy and um, all honesty, the guy's got a breath of fresh air. Um, what they do is, or what we do now, um, is he's developed a model called co-development process. I'm using this as an example that you can actually go and do whatever. There's so much more to QS than just counting means and sitting in a, in a dungeon measuring all that. So they have developed this thing called a co-development model and really it epitomizes what QS is do. It's got development side as well as the QS side, which I was fortunate enough to be exposed to. So he came to me and showed me a, a, a brochure called Touchstone House. Maybe you've seen it one more brief shoot at the moment. Um, what they do is they'll approach the landowner and go, can you please hold your land for X amount of debt? We'll pay you a non-refundable deposit and we'll employ an architect on risk. This architect will develop schemes and we'll sell everything with land. So what happened is they went to touch the house. I don't know if you, if you remember, it burned down several years ago. Um, reasons <coughs> still, still to be decided. Uh, could have been awesome, could have been anything else, but um, it was literally just a building that was a burnt. So pretty much looked like that. And they was like, look, let me try to whip up something. Uh, because it's just standing here. It's been using it, been used as a parking lot. So and you can see the existing facade of there. There's a huge complication. So you kind of tie the existing facade. There's a whole burnt building on the side of there that you can watch. So they said, okay, cool, let me try to develop something there. Um, employed an architect on this. Developed schemes and sold everything off that. Um, went to investors from from Durban, Cape Town, um, internationally, and uh, managed to sell everything off that. And once the developer was 
and fully sold and they'll form a holding company. So you'll essentially buy into that holding company. We'll put down 34.2%, 30% for, um, you need to raise 30% in order to get in bond finance from your banks. Um, so once the developer has got 30% in, you'll get asking for 34.2%, 4.2% is you need to pay tax on the land during, during that transfer period. And um, yeah, so we form a holding company. If I go to Matt and say, Matt, could you use, um, you interested in unit 101, you please put your 34.2% in. You'll essentially get a co-developer, almost a shareholder in a company. Um, so once that, everyone's got their 34.2%, we'll have a shareholder and a share meeting where um, everyone's sitting around the table, all the guys that have actually bought into the company and of that look up, you need to, to um, push the button on this project. Obviously you won't invest in it, so the answer more than often is, is yes. I think Dan's done several developments in Durban and and a couple of young ants on now. I mean, no one said, said no. Um, so once the, the developments um, has got the initiation, we start going on to tender. Well, sorry, a lot. Before we go, before we actually um, have a shell of initiation meeting, we'll have guys to tender. So we'll go out to tender for our, what our big ticket items, so your main building contract, so that means full production. Um, or higher um, further fees like your electrical engineer, your mechanical engineer. Um, or working at risk. You're given, so does anyone know what risk is? Working at risk? No. Essentially not getting paid. So you guys will be, so somehow if you're working at a, as a QS, I'm visiting full production, and the development actually hasn't been hit yet, um, but I can't actually invoice that client or that developer for my fees. That makes sense. Okay, so we hire a lot of professionals on risk. Um, with the clause that if the shareholders in the shareholders meeting when everyone says yes, you're officially off risk. More often than not, it does actually pay off. So we go out and for all our main main ticket items, like our main building contract, um, which started with tech construction and ended up winning. Uh, we go out to tender for our electrical, electrical um, contract. We go out to tender for our mechanical, which is your air conditioning, ventilation. Um, yeah, so essentially just to finalize your budget because what you'll do and what you'll sell your project out at is sell it at a range. So for instance, Tasha and I was selling at 19750 and 18750. 19750 is when you use all your contingencies. Everyone know what a contingency is? Anyway. Okay. Um, so you just mounts that you put on the end of your, obviously your BQ just to add buffers in case you know you got over your estimates or got over uh, um, something or sums or something like that, just yeah. that extra amount that you've been doing. Yeah. Let's say something goes up. Uh, so something you haven't allowed for. Um, for instance, touch the glass. Um, we had a huge amount of kind of metal work items. Just that because you're developing everything on steam, you're selling everything on steam, um, implications like sundry metal work just don't get allowed for, don't get answered for, like stiffeners, um, your, your IP beams and your substation. That stuff adds up. So, for instance, we'll have, let's say, 3 million contingency. Um, that's just in, say, in case something hasn't been allowed for or something that gets over budget. Um, you can't, can't actually develop something right from the get go and allow for everything. So we'll never happen. There will always be something that comes out of the woodwork that, oh shit, you know, we need to do this, we need to do that. So for instance, um, Sunday Mental is a big contingency sum that actually has been counted for Sunday Mental work. So we'll go out for solar rain from 1975 and 1875. Um, including your development contingency, which is in case everything goes to go south. Um, so we sold everything off plan, um, push the button, and yeah, the developments, developments run. Um, I don't know if you have seen the bottom of the green shoe at the moment. That's what the hole looked like, what, three months ago, four months ago. And yeah, this is another scheme that, that we were. Um, <coughs> You guys know the MSC building is? Maritime Shipping Company? As you go around, I'll ask them the other one. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so as you're going around, I'll ask them the other one. You'll see the MSC building on your left, and the big kind of strip of parking in the corner over there. We've done the exact same thing <coughs> for this building over there, for 0.5 of the water. Same sort of scheme, we found the land, we went up to the land and said, look, can you hold this, hold the land for the next month period? And 
the guy was just putting me in there and he was like, you know, don't even think it was, just go out and go And um, Floyd Architects at risk for MWLF. Um, architects that actually worked on, you guys, is anyone from Sakai? Breweries, also Breweries, this is a building that, that they worked on. Uh, they are very much involved in Century City as well. We got into the better schemes. Um, we actually got KTMG and uh, moved from uh, the MC building into this building next, next year. So this should be great ground in about three months. Um, schemes yet to, to be decided. But that's, that's, what I, that's essentially what I've done. So I've been fortunate enough to be exposed to the development side of QSC. Um, I've been thrown in the deep end where um, I've been uh, fortunate enough to, to learn from a guy that, that really is enthusiastic about the industry and, and that actually you know, it gives you a breath of fresh air, opposed to kind of having this negative words just saying that oh, we're wasting time, this is, this is rubbish, rather than go and do something else. Um, but there are job opportunities out there. I've got several mates that, um, I don't know if you guys were aware that Ali came down last year, um, Ali got a music base in Dubai. I've got two mates, one mate that's just started, and one mate that started last year. Um, and it's a decision that you guys really need to, need to make, you know, if you want to earn mega bucks off the bat and have no life, or if you want to pay mountain tax and stay in Cape Town and just enjoy yourself and not earn as much. But um, yeah, there are huge, huge amount of job opportunities. The guy that, that was made for mine last year is a site engineer in, um, in Dubai working on one of the terminals in the airport. Um, another mate of mine uh, got a job at Mace. Um, it's also a huge development slash uh, QS company, uh, World War World War II. Um, but we put on a graduate program and we worked in silos for six months and we ventured over to, to London for about a year um, to go work or I think in a big school or refurbishment jobs. But then come back to Joburg um, and worked there for six months. Um, or you can be like an animated mind and just decide to become a chef. You know, it's really up to you. Um, there are job opportunities there that you just need to actually find them to. Um, Look, I know, I know one is, is a stressful time that you guys kind of think that, you know, jobs will fall into their own, but really just put your feelers out there now sooner than later. It would be a lot more beneficial for, for what it um, Ten year plan. Um, I'm sure you guys have assignments now or whatever. <laughs> ten year plan, it's, it's guys, look, I mean, no one knows what they're going to do in ten years. You know, you don't have no idea what's going to be in the 30 years. 